A good evening to the congregation and welcome as we gather ourselves together this evening to present unto our God a sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Uh, tonight our call to worship is taken from Psalm 66, the first four verses, which read as follows. Make a joyful shout to God, all the earth. Sing out the honor of his name. Make his praise glorious. Say to God, how awesome are your works. Through the greatness of your power, your enemies shall submit themselves to you. All the earth shall worship you and sing praises to you. They shall sing praises to your name. Let's seek to do just that this evening. I'm beginning our service with a word of prayer. Lord God Almighty, uh, you are a God who is worthy of all of our honor and all of our praise. For you yourself are glorious and your works display your awesome power. Uh, even your enemies uh, will one day have to submit themselves to you, but we, as a result of your grace working within our hearts, we come willingly to submit ourselves to you and to worship you. Uh, we ask that you would fill our hearts with gratitude, that our mouths might make known the praises of who you are and what you have done. So we pray for a blessing upon this evening that you might be praised and honored and also that our souls might be encouraged and refreshed uh, for the week that lies ahead. All of this we pray for Jesus' sake. Amen. For our opening song of praise, we'll turn together to selection 66B and sing all four stanzas, standing if able. We'll sing the four stanzas from selection 66B. Once again tonight we are reminded that our help is in the name of the Lord who has made the heaven and who has made the earth, and he greets us tonight with these words. Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth. Amen. We then take the wonderful opportunity to profess our faith. We do so with the words of the Apostles' Creed, saying together with one voice, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, 
who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried, he descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us then join our hearts together in a time of congregational prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, what a wonderful privilege is ours that we can call upon your name, not only in worship, but also now more specifically in the exercise of prayer. Uh, we do pause and reflect upon the greatness of your sovereignty. You are the God who rules over absolutely everything with a special focus and a special attention upon us. Uh, the objects of your eternal love. Uh, Lord, we thank you for your love for us. We thank you that in your love you have provided salvation for us, that you gave your only begotten Son. Uh, Lord, as we reflect upon these wonderful truths, we ask that you would work within us an eagerness and a zeal and a faithfulness in worship. We pray that this place might always be filled for as long as it stands uh, with those who love you, with those who desire to worship you in spirit and truth, those who long uh, to commune with you, to dialogue with you. And would you be pleased, for your own name's sake, uh, to meet with us, again, by your word and by your spirit. Once again, when we reflect upon your sovereignty, uh, we do acknowledge our own sin. We think specifically of sins of self-reliance, our sins also of an unsettledness within our hearts, even a, a discontentment uh, with your providence in our lives. And we pray, Father, not only for the forgiveness of our debts, but we also ask that you would Remove the influence of sin from our hearts, that we might be a people characterized by gratitude, also shown in very practical, tangible ways as we respect human life and as we interact one with another uh, as a congregation, but also then as we go forth in this week uh, in our work and in our recreational activities, as we dialogue with our neighbors. May we show thankfulness to you in how we view human life and how we speak and how we interact with our fellow man. As we go forth in this week, Father, we pray that in your sovereignty you would watch over us, uh, grant us physical safety, keep us from harm and from danger. We pray too for spiritual safety. We ask that you would keep us from the influences of temptation, deliver us from all of the, the tricks and the strategies of the evil one. Work within us by your word and by your spirit a, a certain carefulness. We pray, Father, that you would give us a fear of God within our hearts. Uh, not a slavish, legalistic fear, but rather a true godly piety that we might desire to give the entirety of our lives unto you 
to show forth gratitude and thankfulness for who you are and for what you have done. We ask also that you would give us our daily bread, uh, give us physical strength, uh, give us spiritual strength, uh, give us a mental fortitude. Uh, we hear the reports of the increase in anxiety and depression, especially, not exclusively, but especially among uh, young people. And, and Father, we pray that you would give us peace, a peace that comes from a holistic health, but a peace that especially that comes uh, from embracing your promises, which have been extended to us and to our children, which have been visibly uh, signified and sealed in our baptisms. Uh, but we also are mindful that there are are, are some who have received that sign and seal of baptism who, who have wandered from the faith, those who we might categorize as prodigal sons and daughters. We pray, Father, for them also, and we ask that you would return them back to your church and back especially to a relationship with you yourself. As we seek the spread of the gospel and the growth of the church, and we pray, Father, for Reverend Londosri and the work going on there in Quito, Ecuador. We, we thank you for the formalization of the ecumenical relationships with Luz de Vida. We pray that we as uh, sister churches might be mutually encouraging one to another. And we pray, Father, for their office bearers. Uh, give them uh, much wisdom and energy and a spirit of optimism as they, as they seek to continue the work which you have placed before them. And we think other works of church planting efforts within our own federation, uh, Lord, may they prosper. Would you bless them? And we pray too for Reverend Matt Van Dyken as he continues his missionary work in Tepec. We, we ask, Lord, for the young people associated with that work, uh, that you would grant encouragement and provision uh, for those that are committed to the Lord, and also that you would seek those that have wandered and bring them back. Uh, we pray for the young people of uh, that work and also the young people uh, of all of the churches that, that desire and are seeking godly spouses. Uh, Lord, may the, may the dating practices of our covenant people be in line with biblical principles. Uh, may they not be unequally yoked. But Lord, would you provide in your providence uh, for godly spouses uh, that godly homes might be established uh, we think also of uh, the request to give thanksgiving for the continued fellowship that Reverend Matt Mendeikin has with uh, two other Reformed Presbyterian churches in the area. May these churches be a source of great encouragement one to another. And we ask, Lord, that you would provide a steady employment uh, for those in that area, especially those uh, who have recently graduated. We thank you, Father, for the provision of work that we have. We pray that we might find uh, a sense of purpose in our work, that we might not just see it merely uh, as a grudging matter, but that we might uh, know that when we work appropriately, we do so reflecting our very Heavenly Father. We're thankful for the favorable providences in all sorts of areas. Uh, we often are prone to grumble and complain, but Lord, you have blessed us in so many ways. So give us a a cheerful spirit, a cheerful disposition, and we also pray, Father, for a blessing upon the land in which we live. We, we ask that you would bestow wisdom to our elected officials at the various levels, whether it be the state or uh, the national or even the, the local level. Uh, grant wisdom, especially with uh, some of the, the global issues uh, that continue to arise. Uh, we think of the conflict in the Middle East. Uh, we pray, Father, for uh, much wisdom to be given to all of those who are directly involved. Uh, we pray for our own president and for his cabinet. Uh, Lord, we, we pray that you would bring about conversion uh, by your powerful spirit, a conversion that would then also produce godly wisdom. Uh, we ask, Lord, that you would uh, so see it that our own Elected officials might rule not according to their own pretended wisdom, but according to the truth of your word. Uh, we pray at a more local level for the upcoming elections, even within our own community. And Father, we pray that uh, you would move individuals to vote so that ordinances and laws might be maintained and or established that would restrain the 
expressions of evil and of perversity, and we pray that those same measures might be conducive to upholding that which is morally good. We ask, Father, for those who work within our communities to maintain peace and orderliness. We're thankful for the peace and the orderliness that we have. We, we pray for our various first responders, whether it be the police force, uh, fire and rescue, uh, EMTs. We pray, too, for various organizations that extend uh, tangible exercises of mercy within our community. We think, too, of doctors and of nurses, uh, of retirement villages, uh, of nursing homes. Uh, Lord, we pray for uh, those who are residents within those nursing homes, also those who are shut into their, their own home but have ongoing needs of uh, the weakness of the body, uh, those who are receiving treatments, uh, those who perhaps are receiving medications. Uh, we thank the Lord of those who are experiencing difficulties as medications adjust and as they adjust to those medications, Father, uh, give health and give strength and give a certain resiliency to your people that we might press on even in this earthly pilgrimage, knowing that here ultimately we have no abiding city, but we seek a city which very foundation is laid in the sacrificial work of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so in the midst of this life, our eyes of faith scan the horizon of the future, and we look for the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And our prayer tonight also is, Lord, come quickly. We pray this for your name's sake. Amen. For our song of preparation this evening, we've chosen selection 139B, from which we'll sing stanzas 1, 6, 7, and then 11. We'll do so standing if able, so stanzas 1, 6, 7, and then 11 from 139B.
This evening we will be considering the fifth commandment and that we are not to murder, and we do so in connection with the Heidelberg Catechism's exposition of the commandments underneath the section that deals with gratitude or how we are to show thankfulness to God for the redemption, salvation that he has provided for us through Jesus Christ. Uh, you find Heidelberg Catechism, Lord's Day 40, in your Forms and Prayers a booklet on page 247. Uh, before we read from the Heidelberg Catechism, of course, we'll be reading from the Word of God itself, which we believe is inspired and infallible and inerrant, that is to be authoritative for our doctrine and our life. This evening, we'll be reading from Galatians chapter 5. And if you're using the Pew Bible, you find Galatians 5 beginning on page 1340. So we read first Galatians 5, and then we'll move over to the Heidelberg Catechism, Lord's Day 40, as we consider uh, a right regard for life. Galatians 5 reads as follows, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. Indeed, I, Paul, say to you that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. And I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. You have become estranged from Christ. You who attempt to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. For we, through the Spirit, eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but faith working through love. You ran well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion does not come from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. I have confidence in you in the Lord that you will have no other mind. But he who troubles you shall bear his judgment, whoever he is. And I, brethren, if I still preach circumcision, why do I still suffer persecution? Then the offense of the cross has ceased. I could wish that those who trouble you would even cut themselves off. For you, brethren, have been called to liberty, only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, beware lest you be consumed by one another. I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh, for the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outburst of wrath, Selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. And thus far for now our reading from the Word of God. We then turn to Lord's Day 40, uh, which has three questions and answers. It begins with question 105. What is God's will for you in the Sixth Commandment? And the answer, I am not to belittle, hate, insult, or kill my neighbor, not by my thoughts, my words, my look or gesture, and certainly not by actual deeds. And I am not to be party to this in others. Rather, I am to put away all desire for revenge. I am not to harm or recklessly endanger myself either. Prevention of murder is also why government is armed with the sword. Question 106 asks, does this commandment refer only to murder? And the answer, by forbidding murder, God teaches us that he hates the root of murder, envy, hatred, anger, vengefulness. In God's sight, all such are disguised forms of murder. Question 107, 
Is it enough then that we do not murder our neighbor in any such way? And the answer, no. By condemning envy, hatred, and anger, God wants us to love our neighbors as ourselves, to be patient, peace-loving, gentle, merciful, and friendly toward them, to protect them from harm as much as we can, and to do good even to our enemies. A congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, one of the most important things for us as the Christian church uh, to continually develop is what many have called a Christian worldview, uh, a distinctly Christian view of the world, not only of the creation of the world and the contents of the world, but how we are to live. And the Christian worldview is really nothing other than the biblical worldview, looking at the question, how shall we then live, and answering that question based upon the truths that the Bible reveals. And the Ten Commandments are one of the most important elements in developing a Christian worldview and in maintaining that Christian worldview. Because if you were to ask, how are we then to live in this world? The answer to that question uh, would rest firmly upon the Ten Commandments, especially when we ask that question from a Christian perspective. What does God want us to do? He wants us, if we can borrow from our Presbyterian friends for a moment, He wants us to glorify Him and to enjoy Him forever. How are we to do this? How are we to glorify God? How are we to enjoy God forever? By showing gratitude? By showing thankfulness to Him for who He is and for what He has done? And how do we, we show gratitude? How do we show thankfulness? Well, that's spelled out for us in these Ten Commandments. I think in the introduction to the reading of Scripture, unless my mind didn't quite follow my mouth, I referenced that we would be considering the Fifth Commandment. I misspoke. The Fifth Commandment, of course, is honor your father and your mother. We're dealing with the Sixth Commandment this evening, the commandment in which God clearly states, you shall not murder. And so one of the ten, so to speak, ways in which we are to show thankfulness to God for who He is and for what He has done is by seeking to follow this commandment and avoiding murder. In order to avoid murder, it's important for us to have a right regard for life. And that's the theme for this evening's sermon, a right regard for life. And maybe you want in your mind or in your notes, to insert the word human before life, a right regard for human life, because that more specifically is the subject matter before us this evening. And I want to unfold that theme by noticing, first of all, the source of human life, and then secondly, the protection of human life, and then thirdly, the respect for human life. So, out of gratitude towards God, we ought to follow what Scripture reveals and have within our minds and within our hearts a right regard for human life. Notice, first of all tonight, the source of human life. And if we understand the source of human life, that will help us have a right respect for human life. And the source of human life is humanity as the creation of God and then also humanity in the image of God. So the human race male, female, every single individual person who has, who does, or who will uh, be a part of the human race. That's what we mean when we speak about humanity. Humanity is the creation of God. Human life is not just uh, the result of time plus chance, but rather human life, as is proclaimed so clearly within the Word of God, is a direct result of the creative work of Almighty God. Uh, two texts chosen uh, to support that statement. The first would be Genesis 2, verse 7. And I just want to say in passing to all of us, but especially to our young people, Genesis 1 through 3 
And of course, all of Scripture is important for your development of a worldview, but Genesis 1, 2, and 3 is so important for a right understanding of the world. Some of the most basic institutions of society are, are laid out in their historical origins in Genesis 1, 2, and 3. The further you drift away from a proper understanding of those opening chapters, the further you will drift into all sorts of nonsense. So read Genesis 1 through 3 as you do all of your Bible, understanding that it is an authoritative revelation. And in Genesis 2, verse 7, we read, And the Lord God formed man. In this reference, it is to the man who would be named Adam, which means man, the first human being. The Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. The Apostle Paul echoes the writings of Moses when he states in Acts 17, verse 28, as he interacts with all of the intelligentsia of the day uh, at Athens or Mars Hill, and there, are, there is the entire school of philosophy. There are the Stoics, there are the Epicureans. These are the, the guys, if we can say this, who, who think they got it all figured out. And the Apostle Paul, he comes to them not with human pride or human boasting, but he comes to them with biblical truth, and he says, in him, that is referring to God, in God we live and move and have our being. And that truth, written by Moses in Genesis 2, spoken by Paul, recorded by Luke in Acts 17, is the same today. Human life. is life created by God. And human life bears the image of God. There is a vast difference between the life of an animal and the life of a human being. And we could talk of all sorts of differences, but we get right down to the very essence of the difference is that human life, male and female, equally bear and therefore reflect the image of God. Genesis 1 verse 27, so God created man in his own image. And again, here you have a divinely inspired repetition. God created man in his own image. In his own image, God created him. Male and female, he created them. Sometimes I'm amazed at how clear and simple Scripture is and how confused our world and culture is. In his own image, he created them. But what does that mean to be created in the image of God? Well, it means that humanity alone has the element of a soul. That invisible, immaterial, but very real part of us that includes the functioning of a rational mind, that includes the functioning of a volitional will, that includes the functioning of emotional affections. Now, I know that there are some people, and, and rightfully so, that think very highly of their pets. I pick a pet at random. Maybe you have a dog and you think very highly of your dog and, and you say, well, my dog is a very, very smart dog. And my dog is a very, very, very loyal dog. I don't deny that. I don't debate that. Now, not all dogs have those characteristics, but some do. But your dog does not bear the image of God. Your dog does not have a soul. And your dog, well, your dog can, can run and, and bark and maybe even can do profitable things like help 
herd cattle. Your dog can certainly glorify God as, as the dog does what the dog does as God has created the dog, but the dog cannot live in covenantal relationship with the triune God. But the human person with the soul with a rational mind, with a volitional will, with emotional affections. You see, the human person was created with this capacity to know God and to walk with God and to talk with God and to fellowship with God and to live with God. Not just for a short duration of time, but for all time and beyond time into eternity. So what does it mean in the short time allotted to us to define the image of God, it means that you and I as human beings, as human persons, had before the fall and have after the accomplishment and the application of redemption, we have this unique opportunity that is a reality that we live with God and God lives with us. That God tabernacles among us that God has adopted us into his family. Uh, and this, ultimately, is what gives human life inherent value. What do I mean by inherent value? Inherent, boys and girls, means that, that something's already in. So every single human person, because they are created in the image of God, has value. Not just that they accomplish value, and, and we need to be careful here because sometimes we can be tempted to fall into some form of utilitarianism that I think my value is dependent upon what I can do. Well, certainly, it's good to be able to do things and, and to develop the skill sets that God has given to us in a proper way to be industrious about the Lord's work but a danger is when our sense of identity becomes so bound up in what we think we can do. Because that's not inherent value. And you see, this is what the world is more and more sliding into. This is why the world comes with all sorts of dying with dignity measures to alleviate the great problem. What do you do with people when they are no longer valuable from a utility perspective? Well, the world's answer is, get rid of them. Of course, for now, in the most pleasant sort of speak way, you can read in, in the Netherlands of the mobile death vans. And if you want, and if you are so inclined, uh, you can dial up the number, and a van will stop by. Not, not a delivery van, not with an Amazon package. It's not the UPS truck. It's a van that comes to end your life. Because you, or perhaps someone else, has deemed you no longer are valuable. Because you're not able to do what you once were able to do. My value and your value does not ultimately depend upon what you are able to do, but it depends upon who you are. A human being created by God, bearing His image. And I long and I desire for all of us, but especially for our young people, to realize that. Yes, it's good if the Lord has gifted you with skill sets of intellectual ability to, to develop that to the utmost, but don't think that you're less valuable if your marks are a B instead of an A, or a C instead of a B, or even, we'll go so far, if you have to struggle to even get a passing grade. I've known some of those people, and you know what? They are just as valuable to God as the ones who had a cumulative GPA of 4.2. Because ultimately our value isn't in our intellectual abilities. And maybe you can't run that fast. Maybe you can't jump that high. Your value isn't ultimately bound up in those things. 
It's bound up in that you are created by God. And you bear the image of God. You have been created and you have been redeemed to be a friend of God. If we understand the source of life, it will help us have a right regard for human life, including our own and including that of our fellow man. If we have the understanding of the source of life, we can then transition into our second point, the protection uh, of human life. And this flows logically. If we understand that God is the creator, the giver of life, then we also understand uh, that there is a certain protection uh, of human life. And this protection of human life is in the condemnation of the sins of the flesh and by the work of the Spirit of Christ. Given the natural tendency as a result of the depravity of our heart, most of the commandments are said in the negatives, do not. This commandment is no exception, do not murder. Now, that's not the same as do not kill. There are times in which it is lawful to take human life. We think of just war, and we don't have the time nor the resources to go in the Christian just war theory, but there are cases of just war in which life must be taken ultimately to protect life. You can think also of self-defense. Or when the civil magistrate executes the death penalty in line with Genesis 9, verse 6. But other than those exceptions, the commandment stands that human life is to be protected by forbidding sinful actions but also by forbidding sinful attitudes. The sinful actions that are forbidden, which God says do not do these things, includes, of course, the violent taking of my neighbor's life. Homicide. But also the taking of my own life. Suicide. I want to be clear that there's not biblical evidence to say that suicide is an unpardonable sin. The Roman Catholic Church, because of a gross misunderstanding and numerous points of doctrine, believed and believes that there is no hope for pardon for those who take their own life. There's no biblical support to say dogmatically that there is no hope for pardon for those who take their own life. But that's not the same as denying the sinfulness of suicide. And I plead, if anyone ever hears these words, hear now through the radio, through the internet, tonight, next week, a year from now, if you find yourself in a situation in life where you think maybe the easiest way is the way out, I plead with you that is not the easiest way out. And I assure you there is help and there is hope. Call. Call your pastor. Call an elder. Call a counselor. Call a first responder. That means a policeman or a policewoman. Go to the hospital. Call a suicide hotline call. Suicide is not the answer. There is hope. Christ came that we might have life and that we might have life abundantly. Now, when I, when I make that plea, I'm not minimizing what you may be facing. I'm not completely ignoring the pain that you may be experiencing. 
I'm just coming from an objective perspective and saying, if you think suicide makes all of that better, it doesn't. There is, of course, the act of suicide, but our catechism also would warn us about recklessly and unnecessarily endangering our lives. You know, there is the the graphic forms of suicide, but there's also the slower forms of suicide. The submitting of oneself to destructive, addictive behavior that slowly kills the body of its vitality and of its strength. Be warned that there are behaviors that will kill you. Not in an instant, but in a steadily ongoing process. There are lifestyle choices that some make that bring them to an early grave. And that's not the way to show thankfulness to God. The Christian worldview is not to say, I have been created by God, body and soul. I have been redeemed by God, body and soul. And therefore, I will submit myself to an addictive behavior, to an addictive substance that will ruin my body and bring great pain upon my soul. Now, I know that in our current existence, unless the Lord comes back before we die, I know that we won't continue to live in our current existence, right? There will come the time in which our body and soul separate, but that doesn't mean that we hasten that day. We wait upon the Lord's good timing. And with balance, of course, but we seek to preserve our health. God has given us this as one of His good gifts. And also then that we might enjoy life, that we might enjoy our God. So maintain uh, your life uh, and don't unnecessarily place it in risk. Uh, These are just some of the sample sinful actions uh, that this commandment forbids, but then it goes deeper and, and, and and it prods at the attitudes of the heart that are behind some of these actions including envy, hatred, anger, a certain vengefulness. And and the thing with heart attitudes is you can disguise them most of the time. You can keep them behind the facades much of the time. But just like the, the, the pot of potatoes that's on the stove and the burners turned up just slightly too high, eventually what happens is it boils over. And what does it look like? Or perhaps more precisely, what does it sound like when the hard attitude of envy, hatred, anger boils over? Belittling words. Hateful words. Insulting words. So notice what our catechism says, uh, that yes, I am not to endanger my my own life, and I'm not to endanger uh, the the life of my my fellow man, Uh, but also in the opening answer, answer 105, I am not to belittle, hate, insult, or kill my neighbor, not by my thoughts, my words, my look, or gesture, and certainly not by my actual deeds. You know, and there is that old saying or little song, I don't know if it's still popular, but you know, sticks and stones can break my bones, but words will never hurt me. It's not true. Words, words have immense power. James recognizes this in his general epistle. The tongue, the tongue is so powerful. Powerful to build up, but also powerful to destroy And some people are very, very, very skillful with the sword of their tongue. Oh, sure, they've never actually committed homicide. 
but the sharpness of their tongue has killed their tens of thousands. That is not the way to show forth gratitude to God. Maybe you're saying, well, I, I, I don't say it, I just think it. The Lord looks upon the heart. He knows our attitude. He knows when we are envious. And you know the good definition of envy? Envy is when you can't be happy for someone else. Because you want what they want ultimately just so they don't have it. Are you able to be happy with someone else's success? Someone else's prosperity? When someone else achieves something, are you able to internally rejoice with them, for them, and pass along a sincere word of congratulations? This is godly speech in contrast to ungodly speech. This all comes by the work of the Spirit of Christ. You know, we need to be so, so careful, and I need to remind myself of this, and I need reminders along these lines that we don't fall into some type of legalism. So this isn't just a a, a little 30-minute discourse on go be better next week, try not to speak so cruelly to one another, but we're, we're talking about how redemption works, how salvation works. That's why we chose to read from Galatians 6, or Galatians 5, rather. You know, Paul begins by emphasizing that the gospel is just that, the, the good news of salvation by grace alone. But then he transitions, and he emphasizes the influence of the, the Spirit. If, if the Holy Spirit is residing within our hearts, operating within our hearts, producing the renewal of our soul and the renewal of our mind, then the Holy Spirit will gradually but also continually bring about what we call the mortification of the old man, the dying of the old man. So those old attitudes, those old words will more and more uh, be gradually eliminated and the new man with the fruit of the Spirit will more and more find manifestation in my life and in my actions and in my attitudes. Now, of course, this brings about the necessity for prayer. And it's interesting to look forward once the authors of the Catechism get done with the Ten Commandments. It's almost like they know, now we need prayer. Because you can't produce this change in your heart. You can't produce this change in my heart. I can't produce this change in my heart. The Spirit produces this change. Ultimately, it's the Spirit that brings about the recognition of the value of human life. And it is the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, that brings about also then uh, the attitudes and the actions uh, that respect the value of human life. And that transitions us into our third point, the respect for life towards our neighbor and in our interaction. We are to show respect for human life and our interactions with our neighbor as we display love. Matthew 22, verse 39. And the second commandment is like the first, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You can think also adding to that the golden rule as it's found in Matthew 7, verse 12, Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. We are not to murder. We are to love. We are to love our neighbor. I want to pause just for a moment there. Who is your neighbor? Your neighbor is simply the people that God's providence has put in your life. You know, on one hand, it might be easy to love people from a distance. But what about your closest neighbor? The neighbor who resides underneath the same roof as you do. Your family members. Husbands, love your wives. 
Husbands, are your attitudes towards your wife that of love? Are your words towards your wife that of love? Now, I know the main imperative given to wives is to respect their husbands, but that, of course, goes along with love. Wives, is the attitude of your heart towards your husband that of love? Are the actions, the words, the gestures, the expressions of love? Parents towards their children, children towards their parents, children towards siblings? And what about then the neighbor who lives next to your residence? You know, you don't get to pick your neighbors. Well, maybe you, you move into an association and you, you draft some type of ordinances against certain behaviors. The trash can has to be in the garage at night, no parking of the cars on the street, and on and on and on the list goes. But you don't get to pick your neighbors. But you're called to love them with your attitudes and with your actions. But now what about your neighbor here in this place of worship? Do you love them? Are you patient towards them? Are you kind towards them? Do you have a favorable attitude towards them? And and, and now, within a congregation, there are those members that are easier to love than others. I don't think we do any service by denying that. Leave, Leave aside your consideration of those that you find it easier to love. What about the ones that are more difficult to love? When you find that difficulty to love the unlovable ones, what's your response? Do you just write them off? Or does it drive you to seek grace? Seek grace for your own heart. A word about bitterness. Bitterness is a poison that affects the person who is bitter most of all. Now, the interesting thing with bitterness is that the person who harbors bitterness thinks that by harboring that bitterness, they're going to injure those whom they're bitter towards, but it doesn't work that way. Bitterness harms the person who has the bitterness most. Now, I'm not minimizing life circumstances that happen to certain people that can produce a spirit of bitterness. But I'm saying the Sixth Commandment, you know, it's easy to address the Sixth Commandment to those committing homicide, to to gang violence, or to uh, abortion. And of course, we've tried to trace out the implications that that human life has inherent value from the moment of conception to the moment of natural death. But it's easy to preach sermons against euthanasia. And I suppose we could all sit underneath such a sermon, and we could spend 30 minutes blasting the cultural, societal sins of these grotesque forms of murder, and, and we could meet in the foyer, and we could give our affirmations, yes, that's what our society needs to hear, and we could go home and say, well, that was wonderful. We are reminded of those horrific evils of murder. But did you see him there? I can't believe that he's still a member of our church. I can't believe that I have to sit in the same place of worship with her. Oh, I went in this door, and he went out that door, and I'm so thankful our paths didn't cross because I'll never speak to him again. Really? Hear the commandment of God. You shall not murder. Not with outright acts of physical violence and harm, but also not by words, gestures, expressions of bitterness, of enmity, 
of hatred. Do you think that that shows thankfulness to God? Imagine an earthly father along with an earthly mother, and they prepare a meal, and they set it before the family. Probably, I should be honest, more of the earthly mother does all of this. The earthly father's, of course, there as well. And then the children just start to fight. Do you think the father and the mother look at each other and go, this is nice. Very enjoyable. Very enjoyable fellowshipping with the family. We as a church are the family of God. And by his providence, he has gathered us together. And you might say, we're a bunch of misfits, and we are. You have your unique things. I have my unique things. You can't maybe understand why I'm unique the way I'm unique. I I sometimes wonder why you're the way you are. But we're the family of God. Created by God. Redeemed by God. And why? So he can dwell with us. That he can commune with us. That he can fellowship with us. That he can delight in us. And when we reflect upon those realities, it ought to motivate us, dependent upon God's grace, of course, to show forth thankfulness by loving, by loving our neighbor, even as we love ourselves. Amen. Our Father in heaven, we stand amazed at your love for us, that you not only have created us in your image, a remarkable truth in and of itself, but also that you have redeemed us and have renewed in a gradual but progressive fashion your likeness and creating us after uh, the pattern of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, Lord we come and we, we do confess the root of bitterness clings uh, like, like a burr into our heart. We pray that the words that have been spoken this evening might not only remind us of the value of human life, but also would impress us with the way in which we are to show thankfulness to you by loving you first and foremost, but also by loving our fellow man, our neighbor, the person that we work alongside of, the person that we live next to, the person that we worship alongside of. So, Lord, bless these words. That end, we pray for Jesus' sake. Amen. We turn into our song of dedication, which this evening is chosen from Selection 534. If Abel will stand uh, as we sing the three stanzas, all three stanzas from 534, then afterwards you may be seated again.
This evening's offering, which we now present, will be taken up for Messiah's Reformed Fellowship. After that collection is received, we'll stand as we sing the doxology from number 568. And now, people of God, receive the blessing of your Lord and go together in peace. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.